Hello everyone. So today we have the first introductory lecture about main principles of traumatology and orthopedics. Discuss the types of fractures, their classification, as well as basic principles of fracture treatment. And we'll talk as well about how the fractures heals. So about regeneration of bone tissue in case of fractures. So these are questions that we are going to discuss today. So what is a traumatology? The term traumatology means trauma means injury, logic means science. So this is the science about the injury. Orthopedia was made from two words of Greek origin, orthos, straight and pace child. So that was the science about how to make the child which got a deformity, congenital or developmental, how to make this child straight. On the right side, you can see a picture with a tree, which is uh, deformity and a stick and the rope, which was used to make this tree straight. The same principles are used in orthopedics as we use many orthopedic devices to correct the deformities. One of the first physicians that was studied how to manage injuries and dislocations was Hippocrates, of course. Uh, living more than 2,000 years ago, and uh, he was a great philosopher, the founder of principles, how to treat the fractures and how to uh, treat different dislocations. He invented mechanisms to reduce fractures. Next one was a prominent Greek physician, Claudius Galenus, surgeon and philosopher. And as well, from the Middle East, we know Ali Abu Ibn Sina, who wrote more than 400 books about different problems, different issues of human being. And more than 40 of them were about a person's house, uh, how to improve it, how to keep uh, people uh, away from different diseases and how to prevent them. Another French surgeon, he was a war surgeon, Ambroise Paré. Uh, he was uh, an expert of treatment of wounds. He was also a good anatomist and he was uh, the uh, inventor of various surgical instruments and surgical techniques. Uh, another uh, French uh, surgeon, uh, he was a general surgeon, but he made an important impact in development of traumatology and orthopedics. Um, Leon Dupuytren, with his name, the contracture was named over fingers as well as uh, a very complicated but very common injury of malaria of ankle joint were named. As he described these injuries and he described also the treatment modalities for these fractures. Uh, another famous uh, physician, uh, Pirogov Nikolai Ivanovich, he was the first who used general anesthesia in the field surgeries. He was the first who used plaster bandages for uh, fixation of uh, fractures and dislocations. Uh, he invented principles of aseptics, antiseptics, and uh, actually he was a very bright surgeon. We have also uh, few uh, famous uh, Russian uh, physicians. One was Turner. He was founded the first orthopedic department in St. Petersburg. And Vreden, who works on the Scientific Research Institute in St. Petersburg as well. We have also such famous names as Volkov, Priorov, and Kaplan. 
wrote textbooks and described principles of treatment various pathologies. All around the world, as uh, knows, the Gabriel Abramovich Ilizarov, by name of his frame, so-called Ilizarov frame, it is known that it is possible to make limbs longer if they are shortened. Uh, we can heal those fractures that are healing poorly. We can treat infection. And nowadays we use it very common as treatment for uh, open fractures. So first of all, we'll start about examination of our patients. In our practical classes, we discussed these topics already. So we start from the questioning of the patient, uh, complaints, the history of disease, then goes general examination of a patient. Uh, we should check joints for the range of motion and length of extremities and different segments. We use also palpation, percussion, auscultation for local examination of fracture site, determining a muscular strength and to check for different uh, deformities of the spine and limbs, functional disorders, and then only then we use additional methods of investigations. So a few words about types of joints. So we see that maybe a gliding joint and maybe a hinge joint as in elbow is monoaxial. Usually it's common movement for interphalangeal joints, knee joint, ankle joint as well. And maybe uh, a pivot joint, which is common for first and second vertebras. We have so-called monoaxial rotation in this joint. We also have uh, B-axial joints. In these B-axial joints are uh, two movements like wrist joint we have flexion and extension and adduction and abduction. We have also B-axial joint like a saddle joint of the first finger of the wrist and triaxial joint this is a shoulder joint so called ball and socket joint so movement in three axes are possible the same joint is a hip joint so if we're examining a patient's flexion and extension means it's bended forward and backward we may have also hyper extension this the flexion of the hip joint and extension of the hip joint is demonstrated here. So uh, we should check the range of motion in all joints. And if it is decreased, this pathology is called a contracture. And the number of reasons that can cause for contracture, these reasons we'll discuss with you on our practical classes. Again, movement from the middle line, it is abduction and movement to midline is adduction. It's possible in hip joint and here it is illustrated in the shoulder joint. There we have a picture for adduction and abduction for fingers of hand. And such a complex movement as circumduction can be performed in the shoulder joint. So a few words about rotation. We may perform an external rotation. Uh, it is called supination and internal rotation, which is called uh, pronation. So remember these words, terms as supination and pronation as we use this to describe range of motion. So here is a supination and pronation for a forearm. And for foot, we can define as such movement as aversion and inversion. We may have also dorsiflexion, 
uh, and plantar flexion of the foot. And another movement is opposition, when we can fix or uh, oppose first finger to the fifth and the fourth and the fifth fingers. And uh, such flexion as lateral flexion or bending on the side. Here is an important point uh, about the axis of extremities. So note that axis is a straight line that goes through the main three points as head of humerus, head of radius, and head of ulna. If we have a deviation of this line and the angle which is open to the lateral side, we name this deformity as valgus deformity. And another deformity is a varus deformity when the axis is uh, goes uh, on the lateral side and the angle is open to the middle side. So for this condition, we have a valgus deformity in the elbow joint. If we're talking about axis uh, of lower extremity, uh, it goes usually through spina lacra anterior superior to the middle of the patella and to the second toe. That would be a normal uh, axis of lower extremity. If you have a deviation of uh, knee joint from the straight line and the knee joint is located on the middle part, so we have the angle which is open to the lateral side. That would be a valgus deformity. And another angle which is open to the middle side and the knee joint is located laterally. It is called varus deformity. If this deformity is bilateral, we will have O-shaped legs. So let's move to next part as measurements of our uh, upper limb. So if we measure uh, the upper limb, we use a chromium process to the tip of the third finger. And if we measure the uh, humerus bone, we uh, perform measurements to the lateral condyle. So uh, in, the, in the, for measurements of whole upper extremity, we use anatomical position. For measurements of segments, we use flexion position. As in this position, we can determine lateral condyle of the humerus and we can perform measurements. To measure the forearm, we should do it from a lateral epicondyle of humerus, or we may use another point as our olecranum to the steloid process of ulna. Uh, if we want to measure uh, the length of low extremity, we should uh, start from spina lac anterior superior to the tip of the medial malleolus. And we should compare both sides, right and left. Measurements of femur from the tip of the greater trochanter to the uh, gap between the epicondyle of uh, femur and tibial head. The same measurements for tibia should be done from the gap of the knee joint till the tip of the lateral malleolus. Again, I will say that we should compare measurements on one side with measurements on the other side. So a few words about types of injuries. So injury may be open or closed, may be open from inside out or from outside in. There are different types of uh, injuries as dislocations, subluxations, and sprains. So for dislocation, you see that tot we have a total loss of contact between two articular surfaces. So the head of humerus on this example goes out of the glenoid area and goes to the sub 
to the axillary region, so-called inferior dislocation of humerus. If we have a partial loss of contact, we, call, we, we talk about subluxation. It may be as a part of acute injury, as well as uh, a part of some, some disease. And sprains are usually when some part of ligament or tendon is torn, and so incomplete uh, of the ligament. So, what are the main causes of trauma? It may be a direct violence when the injury is applied directly to the place where fracture occurs. This is very common for fractures of olecranum, for kneecap fractures, fingers as you see. And it may be indirect injury when the foot is twisted but fracture occurs above its tibial bone. We may also have so-called fatigue fractures. A repeated stress on these areas can cause a fracture. This is very common for recruits when they start their training. And usually it don't need specific treatment. It will heal by itself, but you should know about the possibility of such fracture. And as well, we are talking about pathological fractures. These are fractures that uh, happens in the areas when bone is weak. So which types of fractures are possible? We may have a fracture which called, is called hairline fracture. It is a thin line, which is hardly can be seen in the X-ray and often is missed. So a very good example here is scaphoid fracture. And if you make an AP view, you can miss it. So a 45 degree rotation of view should be performed to reveal this fracture. So uh, it is possible also for different parts of bones as tibia and foot as well. Another pattern fracture pattern is a green stick fracture. When we have a damage on one cortical layer and another cortical layer is intact. So we have various types of these green stick fractures, but most of them are common for children. We don't have a significant shift. We have mostly angulation that we should correct and fix it with some sort of bandage or surgery. We have a simple type of a fracture when we have only two bone fragments. And we may have a so-called oblique fractures when there is some angle between the axis of extremity and the fracture line. So we, and also we have a spiral fracture. We have some rotational force. That's the fracture side goes in a rotated way. So you see, in many cases, if the fracture is not significantly displaced, we don't have shortening. But if we have oblique fracture, which is not stable, we may have some shortening here. We may also have fractures which are multi-fragmentary with many fragments. And we may have a double fracture, a fracture used on two levels, junction of middle set and upper set, junction of middle set and lower set. Another type of fracture is so-called impacted fracture. When a distal part of bone is driven into the proximal part. So in these cases, sometimes we don't see significant displacement. But it may occur such things that these bone fragments goes apart and they are completely displaced. For spongy bone, it is possible when we have a compression or crush fracture. 
is common for calcaneus and vertebral body, which is compressed between two vertebrae. And another type of fracture is so-called evolution fracture. So the place where the tendon is attached is evolving the bone. And in these cases, the bone is looks like weaker than the tendon. It is common for uh, lesser hunter, for patella, a lower part or the proximal part of patella, and some other areas. Uh, as well as we can talk about depressed fractures that are possible. A very important issue is a fracture which is involving the joint. Even a fracture which is close to the joint can cause significant problems with joint function. But if we are talking about fracture which is involving the joint, it may be a partial involvement, it may be involvement with a comminution. So these injuries are considered to be more complicated and the prognosis of treatment is not so good. Now let's talk about fracture dislocations. So we discussed with you already fractures and dislocations as well. So actually this is a combination of fracture and a dislocation. So uh, if we're talking about this fracture dislocations, so we should manage both pathologies. So first of all, we are reducing a dislocation and then we should repair the fracture by mean of internal fixation usually. So uh, many students are confused about complicated fractures. So they think that more bony fragments, more complicated fracture. The complicated fracture is a fracture which uh, when bone fragments cause injury of some vital structures such as arteries, nerves, or the fracture becomes open and they need more uh, intensive treatment. So uh, the first thing that you should do, working as a doctor, you should know how to describe the fracture, how to make the diagnosis. For this, you need to know an algorithm, what should you mention in your diagnosis. And of course, you need to know types of fractures and types of displacement, all the things you should uh, use for your diagnosis. So first of all, we're talking about bone, which is a uh, long tubular bone, and it has its parts. There's no difference whether it is femur or it is tibia, but every bone has its epiphysis, its metaphysis, and its shaft or diaphysis. So epiphysis and metaphysis may be distal and may be proximal. And a shaft can be divided on three equal thirds. So this would be a proximal one third, this would be a medial one third of shaft, and this would be a distal one third of shaft. Next, you should describe the displacement. And displacement should be checked in two views, AP view and lateral view. If you see only at one view, you can miss a displacement in another view. So look on this example. We have lateral view, no displacement. We have AP view, we have a displacement. So we have a shift, and this is a distal part, it is shifted laterally. On next example, we don't have a shift on AP view, but on the lateral view, we have a shift to the posterior side. So this would be complete posterior displacement. 
And the first example, we have both lateral displacement and posterior. So we call it posterior lateral displacement. The displacement may be partial when there is a contact between cortical layers. This will, he will heal because if there is a contact between bones, the fracture will heal. If you have no contact, you have a full displacement, so it means that there may be problems with healing and you need to re reduce it better. So this is an example of full opposition bone fragments. Of course, it is possible for unstable fractures. And only for full opposition, if it's possible, then there is a shortening of the limb. You see that if the displacement is not complete for transverse fracture, the length of the limb is the same. And next, an important thing that we should describe with you, it is angulation, so-called maybe lateral angulation or anterior angulation. So it can be described in different ways. So this can be described as tilting to the lateral side or the angle which is open to the lateral side, so-called valgus angulation. The same angulation tilting to the anterior side or it may be described as the angle which is uh, open to the anterior part, so-called recurvation. And the last but quite important uh, displacement is rotational displacement. Looking at this film, you may see, you may think that there's no displacement, but actually it is rotation. And to see this rotation, we should make a long film, and only in long film, you can see one joint, another joint, and to see that one joint is in the position of rotation. Okay, so to check the rotation, you need to make a long X-ray. So, what do you mean when you talk about open fracture? So we mean that there is a wound here, and we have a fracture, and there's a connection between the wound and the fracture. So it may be a big wound, it may be a small wound, it may be a fracture which was made by a bone fragment going outside, or maybe a hard object was damaged in the skin and then broke the bone. So actually we have the algorithm, uh, what we should do with patient with uh, injuries. And we'll start from the beginning, you know, ABC uh, system uh, of medical help. It is performed as advanced trauma life support system. And of course you need to check the general condition of your patient. If the patient needs some resuscitation measures, you are performing them. If no, you are making some pre-hospital management as giving analgetics, immobilize limbs, apply ice, elevate position of the limb, and if low blood pressure and shock development, so you should give some IV in, in, infusions. Then it is taken to the hospital, examination with specialists on each field, and then you should perform an X-ray. And here you can see what to do. If we have a patient which is negative for bony injury, so we perform soft tissue repair if needed. If soft tissue repair is not needed, it's just need just rest and rehabilitation. Have a patient with a dislocation we should reduce this dislocation. Mostly we are doing this in closed way for, for closed dislocations. And if this dislocation is fresh, if many days have passed after the dislocation, we should perform an open type. Then we're making an X-ray 
fixation with a bandage and immobilization. So what we are doing for fractures, we should check whether the fracture is closed or open. So for closed fracture, we are reducing it, making an X-ray. If good position of the fragments is obtained, we immobilize it with a bandage and making X-rays and the patient goes to the rehabilitation. For unsatisfactory position, we should perform open reduction and fixation with internal device or X fix. And then patient is in fracture heals, patient goes to the rehabilitation. If fracture have not healed, we can perform some reconstructive surgeries, applying bone grafts and other modalities until the fracture is healed. So what to do with open fracture? It's quite a hard thing because it may be complicated with osteomyelitis and even amputations. So if the wound is clean, we can, in some cases, the first grade of gustilo anderson classification, and sometimes for second A grade, we can perform internal fixation. And then rehabilitate our patient, and that's it. For non-cleans, it's prohibited. We should not insert implants for these areas, and we should uh, apply external fixator, clean the wound, perform debridement, antibiotics. And in some cases, we can convert and go to the internal fixation. But in most cases, we use still x fix. So that's actually the general plan, the general algorithm, what and how we can treat patients with different injuries. So we also need to know how fracture heals and uh, that will help you to understand uh, the principles of treatment. So there are many uh, variables that affect fracture healing. We'll see how many they are. And we may start from these local areas, so-called severe tissue damage. Of course, if you have a high energy nerve fracture, the injury is very intensive, problems with blood supply, and uh, fracture may heal poorly. Then uh, we have infection. It also affects very negatively on fracture healing. The same segmental fractures or pathological fractures may heal poorly. If we have a soft tissue parts like muscles and fascia between bone fragments, uh, it's interposition and it may cause problems. Uh, we may have poor blood supply, which impairs healing as well. We have systemic disorders that cause problems with healings as well. Malnutrition and corticosteroid use are considered to be as well negative factors. And so some are negative factors from uh, wrong treatment. We call them iatrogenic, so uh, they may also delay healing. One of them is a distraction of the fracture site, which is done uh, for by mean of skeletal traction or by uh, external frame. So in some cases, it can cause a delayed healing. So a uh, process of fracture healing is uninterrupted, continuous process, but we can define three different phases in it. So first phase is a phase when we have an injury and tissues are damaged. There is hematoma on the site of injury. This hematoma are forming a clot. And after this, um, here we go to the reparative phase. And in this reparative phase, uh, we have a uh, growing of blood vessels into this newly formed tissue, and there is immigration of the mesenchymal stem cells to this area, 
that are transferred later into the bone cells as osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And we have a formation of so-called uh, soft callus. So this is a callus which is immobilizing the fracture site, but actually it's not hard and some bending of the fracture site is still possible. And then later uh, we have a formation, uh, formation of hard callus, so-called woven bone. It is not differentiated, but we have already uh, good immobilization of fracture site and no movement. So this we consider as end of our treatment and patient is satisfied because he can use his limb already and fracture has healed, no movement. But still we should remember that this remodeling phase continues and sometimes it takes one year, one year and a half to rebuild this primary bone callus and remodel it according to the previous structure of the bone. So this is the first stage as was described, a fractural bone and hematoma formation. Then we have a formation of soft callus and hard callus. And you see that in this age you can palpate like increasing of the volume of the bone. And we have a growth of bone tissues from one side to another side. And one point I would like to say for you that uh, we may have a so-called a primary healing of uh, fractures. So this is a type of healing when we have a, which is possible when we have a very small gap between bone fragments, when the fracture is uh, immobilized correctly and there is no movement between fracture fragments and uh, there is di direct growth of osteons from one bone part to another one. Uh, that is possible practically for uh, impacted fractures or for fractures like hairline fractures and for fractures that were treated surgically with precise reduction and stable fixation. So we can expect such problems of union as now union, delayed union, and non-union. So uh, if the fracture heals not properly, not proper, in not correct position, we may expect non-union. So malunion is a common cause for decreasing of function. We can have also a delayed union which is uh, a problem when fracture is healing, but has not healed in, uh, in average period of time. So uh, if this time have passed and still you don't see clinically and radiological signs of healing, we have this diagnosis of delayed union and we should, you, we should wait two terms more but if these two terms have passed already and we have no healing, we're talking about non-union. And another term for this is a pseudoarthrosis of house joint. It may be of different types. And now we'll see a few examples. That's uh, one is a hypertrophic uh, non-union when we have uh, quite big callus, but we still have movement at the fracture side. And another type is atrophic non-union, when we don't have callus at all, and you see osteoporotic areas and sclerosis of bone ends, but you don't see callus around it. So this is atrophic non-union. So main principles of treatment. We should start from our pre-hospital management as most of the patients get their injury not in the hospital. So first of all, you need to perform 
provide fast medical aid. And that's not only the doctor who can do this, everyone can do it. So what you should do? You should spleen the fracture, immobilize it. In this case, you can use spleens that are factory made or you can use spleens handmade as you wish. You may use analgetics because every patient will have pain. Uh, if there are wound and bleeding, you should stop this. And we will have another lecture for principles, how to control the bleeding and how to cover the wound, clean the wound and so on. And you should know how to do this for various locations, upper limb, lower limb. As well, you should apply eyes. Due to formation of derma, you should prevent this and elevate the position of a limb. And as well, you should refer to an orthopedic doctor as soon as possible. So you may use any car or you may use an ambulance and get to the to get to the clinic as soon as possible. So on this slide you can see how immobilization of upper extremity is done. So we use so-called Kramer wire splints. You can flex it, you can extend it, you can form it as you wish. And note that for forearm fractures, elbow joint and wrist joint is fixed. So the main idea is to immobilize two nearest joint to stabilize fracture. If you don't have Kramer wire splint, you may use a sling, you may use a diso bandage, or you may use any hard material like a stick, umbrella, wooden board, and so on. Kramer wire splints are good as they can be used to immobilize low extremity as well and uh, immobilize area of shoulder joint as well. So you can combine few K, a few Kramer wire splints for uh, femur as uh, immobilization, but that's, that's actually not a good option. But if you don't have other splints, you may use it. So you see one splint is flexed in the knee joint and is placed on the posterior surface, one is placed on the lateral surface, combined with another one, because actually these are not as long as needed. And one is applied on the middle part. So see how it can be used to immobilize the lower extremity. Uh, this is special splint, it is made of uh, a few parts, this is a wooden splint introduced by Diterix. It has a wooden board fixed to the foot. It has a part which is adjustable. You can adjust the lens and use it on the lateral side of femur and middle side of the femur. As well, a part for foot and a, a stick that can be twisted and it can form a traction. So this is a Diterix wooden splint that can be used for immobilization of femur. And it can pr provide quite good fixation and prevent displacements of these bone fragments on the way to the hospital. So this is maybe the best option to use for hip injuries, hip fractures and femur fractures. So uh, we have the algorithm that you should remember that we should uh, start from the first point. We should save the patient's life. This is the most important task for us. So uh, the second main task is to save the limb, the extremity. Uh, the third one, we should restore the anatomical structures, if possible, of fractured bone. And then the last one is to restore the function of injured organs. Actually, it's for extremities, for low extremities, the function is to walk, and the for upper extremity is to perform to, to perform the work on the specialty. So uh, I think that's all for today. 
have a nice day. Good Thank luck. You, sir. Same to you. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, sir.